The following program is brought to you by Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program, committed to working together to protect the natural environment. Florida seagrasses grow as meadows in estuaries and shallow coastal waters. Recreational opportunities, the fishing industry, and the economy depend upon the health of seagrass. Marine ecologist Brad Robbins of Moat Marine Laboratory studies seagrasses. What the grass does is it filters the water, it acts to hold the substrate, it takes up nutrients, it feeds large animals like manatees and turtles, it provides food for smaller animals, it also acts as shelter and refuge for all types of fish and invertebrates, where we find seahorses and urchins, we find blue crabs, and as many kinds of fish as you could imagine we find right here in, in the seagrass beds. Game fish such as sea trout, redfish, and snook use seagrasses. Other less apparent organisms are also found there. These are tube worms. It's what these little white dots are here. And they, they too serve a purpose. I mean, they, they provide food for different animals. And what you see here, the reason why this blade isn't green, as you might expect, is this blade is, is because it's got the little animals and plants on it. One blade is real green and the other blade is kind of a brownish color and it's got little white spots on it. The discoloration in the white spots are the plants and animals that live on the leaves or the blades of the plant itself. And this part of the blade, the green blade, is fairly new. It hasn't been settled yet. In recent decades, seagrass has suffered significant losses, some due to prop scarring. Prop scarring is when a boat's propeller digs up seagrasses, although other parts of a boat, like the hull or even an anchor, can also cause damage. Generally, seagrass prop scarring occurs when boats run in too shallow water over seagrass beds or run aground. Seagrass scars are most visible in shallow areas where the water clarity is fairly clear, and you'll see them as linear lines. Sometimes they go in kind of a circular pattern. An indicator a boater should recognize as being in too shallow water. Prop wash, and this is the dark water that spits up behind your boat. And sometimes there'll be drift algae and floating seagrass along with it. If you see that, the first thing that you should do is immediately idle your boat and pull up your motor. Um, don't try to you know, gun it and try to get out of the um, shallow waters. That um, is only going to further the damage to the seagrasses. Before getting into this predicament, there are many strategies boaters can use to avoid destroying the aquatic plant. Knowing your boat is important because you need to know what the draft of your boat is. Uh, my boat, for instance, is not going to be the same as the boat that's coming up behind me. I draw more draft than a skiff. I draw more draft than a um, flats boat, but I draw far less than, say, a cabin cruiser. You also need to know, um, in addition to what your draft is, sitting here idle, um, not moving in the water, how it changes as you move through the water. So if we're up on plane, we're drawing less water. Um, if we're moving slowly through the water, we're drawing more draft. Um, so knowing your boat is very important. Um, that dictates where you are able to run. Boaters should stay in marked channels as much as possible, but when leaving the channel... As a general rule of thumb, we like to say stay a foot above the top of the blades of seagrasses, and that gives you enough water column between your prop and the seagrass blades to run safely without causing damage to the seagrasses themselves. Out here we can see shallow seagrass areas. You can see the different colors in the water and these are important to be able to recognize, particularly in the darker waters. Sometimes it's more difficult to distinguish the colorations but they are visible and um, of course wearing polarized sunglasses is an important part of that. If one runs into a seagrass bed or ends up in waters that are too shallow for the boat... The first thing you should do is raise your motor and idle your boat. Once you get to that point, then a lot of times when you're, when you're down and flat in the water, you will drift and hopefully you'll drift beyond the um, shallow area. Of course, sometimes you may drift in further and that's not necessarily a good thing. There's, there's a number of things boaters can do. If they have an auxiliary motor that has a shallower draft, for instance, a trolling motor or just a smaller kicker motor, oftentimes they can maneuver using that and get across the bar. A lot of boats have um, push poles that they can use and they can push their way out into the deeper waters. 
And then of course we as boaters should not be afraid to get out and push if we need to, to get to deeper water where we can safely navigate. Boaters can get helpful information before they ever get on the water. Every boater should have navigational charts and tidal charts. It's important to know what the tides are doing in your area. Um, in Charlotte Harbor, we have roughly a foot and a half tide range. It will change from location to location. And another thing that's important is to arm yourself with local knowledge. Um, this is a nav chart. It's, um, they come in various forms. Some of them are, are paper nav charts that roll up. This one just happens to be a book. These are available at most marine stores, and they will tell you um, what the depths are. Other good sources of information are boaters' guides. There are boaters' guides to almost every estuary in Florida. With the increase of boaters has come the increase of prop scarring. It can take a long time for seagrasses to recover. With stainless steel props and with this soft sediment, this it's sandy sediment, you can dig down several inches if you run across. And if you have a big boat that draws a lot of water and it's got two or more props in the water at once, you can dig a fairly substantial uh, scar and the scars are deep enough that they, the grass takes a long time to, to grow back. The turtle grass can take up to 10 or 11 years to fill in the scar. Some places in Florida, the scarring is so bad that they have to come back in, fill the scar in with sediment, and then plant to get the plants to grow again. In addition to prop scarring, boaters can negatively impact seagrasses by releasing pollutants, such as oil and fuel, into the water. It can be oil that's discharged from the bilge overboard, or accidental fuel spills. These can be pretty significant. Uh, for instance, a gallon of fuel can pollute over a million gallons of water, and that's, that's pretty significant. Because seagrasses are so important to Florida's economy and environment, damage to them can result in state and federal fines. Seagrasses contribute to our quality of life in many ways, from providing habitat for fish species to keeping the seawater clean and clear. The seagrasses play a vital role in estuaries with the, the health of the estuaries, keeping the estuaries clean, keeping lots of bait fish so you have the bigger recreational fishes that are here. Uh, they're, just, they're just part of a healthy ecosystem. If you want to have a healthy environment, a healthy estuarine environment, you want to have your basic plants, and the basic plants are the seagrasses. If you would like more information about seagrasses and other aquatic habitats, log on to www.charlotteharbornep.org.